So, so good morning, everyone. I'm David Galvin, and I'm here to tell you what being a mathematician is about. But first, a pop quiz. <sighs> Don't worry, this one's easy. It's the end of the fourth quarter. Your team's up by three points. Your opponent is going for a field goal to tie the game, bring it to overtime. Now they bring on their backup quarterback to be the holder. You know that eight of the last 10 times that he's been the holder, they faked the kick and gone for a touchdown. Question, what do you do? There's a lot of different options, but probably if you want to win the game, you defend against the sneak touchdown pass. What you're doing here is observing a pattern and acting on it. What you're doing is being a mathematician because mathematics at its heart is the search for and the study of patterns. There are some mathematicians, topologists, who study broad patterns of shape. A topologist can't tell the difference between a coffee mug and a donut. This is a piece of ceramic with a single hole through it, the handle. This is a piece of dough with a single hole through it, the donut hole. They are the same shape. There are other mathematicians, geometers, who study the fine details of patterns of surfaces. A geometer would say there are some parts of the coffee mug, like the bottom of the mug, that are flat. But unless you sit on it, there's no part of the donut that's flat. They are different surfaces. There are other mathematicians, analysts, who study patterns of motion, such as how the heat is flowing from the hotter coffee mug out into the cooler room. I'm not a topologist, I'm not a geometer, I'm not an analyst. I'm a combinatorialist. I drink the coffee, I eat the donut, and I think about patterns among numbers. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the what comes next in the sequence puzzles. Here's an example. This one's pretty easy. What comes next? Yes, these are just the ordinary counting numbers. OK, let's do a more interesting example. What comes next in this sequence? I'm hearing a lot of answers, but I just heard 21. Thank you so much. What you did was you noticed the pattern. The pattern is that each number is the sum of the two previous numbers. So that means that the next number in the sequence, if this pattern continues, should be 8 plus 13 or 21. This sequence of numbers is called the Fibonacci sequence. We've been studying it for over 2,000 years. It comes up in computer science, in biology. It even comes up in art. Here's a, a, another example. This one, this one is not as easy. At first, it seems like you're multiplying each term by three to get the next term. But that pattern breaks down after a while, and it's not clear how it's continuing. I'm going to get back to this sequence in a while, but First, let me give you an example of the sort of problem I think about that leads me to patterns among numbers. Let's say you like to go for a run every evening. A long run, 72 blocks. Why 72? Well, maybe you're a big fan of Travis Frederick. Ah, I see he has some fans here, yay! So, you set out on your run from your house, which is the red dot at the center of the city, and you pick a direction to run in, and then each time you come to an intersection, you either go straight ahead, or you turn left, or you turn right. Now, you like variety, you like change of scenery, so you have a rule. You never revisit a spot that you previously visited on your run. Here's an example of how your run might begin. Here is an example of a way that your run is not allowed to begin. Notice that there are some intersections that you visit multiple times here. Now, as I say, you like variety, you like change of scenery, so you don't want to repeat a run from night to night. For how long can you keep this up? How many different 72-block runs are there? 
Well, this is a pretty ambitious question, so let's approach it step by step. It's pretty clear that there are four one-block runs because you can set out north, east, south, or west. Now, each of these one-block runs can be extended in three different ways to a two-block run. You can go straight ahead, left, or right. So that means that there are three times four, or 12, two-block runs. Each of these two-block runs can also be extended in three different ways. If you go straight, straight, you can go straight ahead, left, or right. If you go straight turn, you can go straight ahead, left, right for your third block. So that means there are three times 12 or 36 three block runs. There's a pattern emerging, multiply by three each time. But when you come to four block runs, you have to start being a little bit careful. Most three block runs can be extended in three different ways, like go north, 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 or go north, east, east. But there are some three block runs, like north, east, south, that can only be extended in two different ways if you want to obey the rule about not revisiting a spot you had previously visited. So you have to do this count with some care. If you do it carefully, you'll find that there are exactly 100 four block runs. So now I can go back to my sequence and you should recognize these numbers now, 4, 12, 36, 100. This is the sequence counting the number of runs of various different lengths. If you have a lot of patience, and you're very careful, you can figure out that the next number in the sequence is 5,916. I bet no one guessed that. <laughs> so, for over 70 years, mathematicians, physicists, and chemists have been studying self-avoiding runs. Literally millions of computer hours have been devoted to the problem. Recently, a mathematician from Australia, Iwan Jensen, was able to calculate the exact number of 71 block runs. There are this many of them. This is an enormous number. If you wanted to store all of these runs on a computer, which is what you'd need to do if you wanted to push the count up to 72 blocks, you would need a very big hard drive. 100 gigabytes would not be enough. 100 terabytes would not be enough. You'd actually need a hard drive that had about 100 billion billion terabytes. For this reason, although we know roughly how many 72 block runs there are, there are a lot, we don't know the exact number and we probably won't know for a long while. Now, at this point, everybody I imagine has one question and one question only. Why on earth would I or anybody else care at all about this question? I'm gonna give you two answers. I'm gonna give you the official answer and then I'm gonna give you the real answer. Here's the official answer. Self-avoiding runs actually come up in a number of scientific problems. Here's an example from chemistry. Polymers are long chains of atoms. They are everywhere. Rubber and polystyrene are polymers. At the micro level, so are DNA and protein. These chains of atoms, they don't go around in long, straight lines. They twist and bend and turn in all kinds of ways. Here are some pictures of actual nanopolymers. Now think about how one of these polymers might wiggle. Each atom along the chain locates itself nearby to the previous atom on the chain but there's a very, very important rule that has to be obeyed, which is that no atom is allowed to locate itself where an atom had previously located itself. There just isn't room. Just as when you came in here earlier this morning, you couldn't sit on a seat that someone else had already taken. That means that as you trace along the wiggles of a polymer, you're actually tracing a self-avoiding run. And anything that you can say about self-avoiding runs translates immediately into something about polymers. How many self-avoiding runs are there? That's how many polymers there are. How far from home are you when you finish your run? That's how far apart the ends of the polymer chain are. Here's another example. This one is coming from physics. When water cools to freezing, ice crystals begin to form. Here's a a very close-up of an ice crystal forming on a plate of water. 
About 50 years ago, physicists developed a model called the lattice gas model to help explain this process of ice crystal formation. It's a very simple model, but it's complex enough that there are still questions about it that we're not able to answer. With some colleagues from Georgia Tech, from Berkeley, and from Columbia, I've been looking at this model recently, and we've discovered a really strong connection, not quite to self-avoiding runs, but to self-avoiding drives. Draw a very fine grid on the surface of the water and imagine that it's a map of Manhattan with its one-way system. Even-numbered streets run east-west, odd-numbered streets west-east. Even-numbered avenues run north-south, odd-numbered avenues run south-north. A self-avoiding drive is a drive around Manhattan that doesn't revisit an intersection, just like a self-avoiding run but also that obeys the one-way system, which, of course, a runner doesn't have to do. What we discovered was that the boundaries of these ice crystals follow exactly the paths of self-avoiding drives. So using the mathematical theory of self-avoidance, we're able to significantly enhance our understanding of this model and begin to answer some of these 50-year-old questions. Okay. That was the official answer to the question, why do I care? Now, let me tell you the real answer. This is a startlingly simple question. We've all understood it in just a few minutes. It's simple, but it is absolutely not easy. It has challenged some really smart people for generations. With science, we can do really amazing things. We can send a probe to the surface of Mars and have it beam back crystal clear pictures. We can build prostheses for a marine who has lost both his legs in combat. But mathematics is filled with seemingly simple questions that turn out to be fiendishly difficult when you start to look at them carefully. I consider these questions a personal challenge from nature to my intellect. I relish the time spent grappling with them, trying to pin down their complexities. Many of you, I'm sure, play card games. Who plays card games? And many of you maybe do Sudoku puzzles. Not even do Sudoku. Or crossword puzzles, maybe. So all of these things are really great mental exercises. The problems that I'm talking about here these are the ultimate in mental athletics. Solving one of them, it's an unparalleled high. It's scoring the winning touchdown in a championship game. Making genuine progress on one of them, even if I don't solve it, that's still really satisfying. That's still winning the game. The fact that many of these problems have practical applications that is a really lovely bonus, but it's just that, it's just a bonus. It is a minor consideration beside the intellectual thrill of the search for truth. My colleagues and I, mathematicians and all scientists, here in this room, all around the country, all over the world, we are all on the same team tackling these really hard problems. We all want to play the best game that we can. We all want to win. But more than anything else, we all want to play because we love the game. And let me tell you something really nice. I don't have to retire at 30 because I've blown out my knee. I can keep doing this for as long as I like. Let me go back to the pop quiz. Remember that it was the end of the fourth quarter, you're up by three points, your opponent is going for a field goal to tie the game. You could just send a handful of defenders out onto the field, have them bumble around randomly. Whatever the outcome, I don't think that it could be very satisfying. Or you could examine the situation and make a decision based on some sound principles of reasoning. If you are absolutely sure that they're going for the field goal, then throw everything at blocking it. But if there is evidence, a pattern, that suggests that they might fake the kick, then defend against the sneak touchdown pass. 
When you apply yourself like this, making a decision based on observation and then executing your plan, then whatever the outcome, win, lose, or heaven forbid, tie, you will have the satisfaction of achievement. You faced a challenge and you used all of your resources to tackle it, including your mental resources. And that is what being a mathematician is all about. Thank you very much. Thank you.